Hi, I'm David Taub, and welcome to the Parsha Rabbit Hole, where I find something weird in the weekly Torah portion and follow it all the way down until it gets even weirder. This week, when I was at the very beginning of my rabbit hole research, I asked my brother, Rabbi Chase Taub, if he had any ideas of where to start. And immediately, he had a very specific suggestion of where I should start, and this is what he said. Okay, I know how this uh, Parsha Rabbit Hole works, okay? I watched every episode. Um, Parsha's Vayetze, and you need something that's going to be weird. I have a good sense for weird. I think I'm the one who taught you to have an appreciation for the weird. Look into the Dudoyim. Those are the mandrakes, the flowers that little Ruvain as a child picks and he gives to his mother and then she trades with her sister. Look into the flowers, follow the flowers. You're going to find some weird stuff. I'm pretty sure of it. Okay, follow the flowers, the mandrakes. Now, if any of you out there are familiar with the Harry Potter books or movies, you'll immediately recognize the word mandrakes because that's something that comes up a few times in those books and it's mentioned as having magical properties. Today, we're going to re mandrakes. And the reason why mandrakes are used that way in those books in the first place is because there's a lot of lore surrounding mandrakes as having magical properties. I asked my brother if he was aware of any of this stuff and he said he wasn't. He just has a really good radar for weird. And he was right. The mandrakes give us a lot to go on, so let's follow those flowers and jump right down into the rabbit hole. This week's Torah portion, Parshas Vietze, is very full. There's a lot going on. Most of Yaakov, or Jacob's sons, who are eventually the founders of the 12 tribes of Israel, are born during this week's Torah portion, and there's a whole space race going on between Leah and Rachel to have more babies. Eventually, towards the halfway point in this whole story of all these kids being born, we get the story of the flowers. And this is what it says in the parsha. Ve'yelech Reuven b'mei ketzir chitim ve'yimtza didayim besada ve'yave oisam el Leia imay ve'toyme Rachel el Leia tenin na li medudai b'neich. Once at the time of the wheat harvest, Reuven came upon some dudayim in the field and brought them to his mother Leia. Rachel said to Leia, "Please give me some of your son's dudayim." Now, if you'll notice, I didn't translate Dudayim as mandrakes, because first we have to answer the question, how do we even know that we're talking about mandrakes? A bunch of translations translate it that way, but how do we know that that's what we're talking about, and how do we know it's the same mandrakes as the ones that have the lore connected to it? Maybe the English translations are using the word mandrakes, but it's not connected to the magical mandrakes, and it's not even worth exploring, which would mean we don't even really have a rabbit hole. According to Rashi, they're not mandrakes at all. Rashi says that the flowers were jasmine flowers, and different commentaries say different things. In the Gemara, there's a discussion about what the Dudayim were, and one of the opinions there says that the Dudayim were Yavruchin. This is also how Unkelis translates Dudayim in the verse into Aramaic. Okay, so then what are Yavruchin? According to Rashi, he won't tell us. He says he doesn't know what they are. The key to figuring out what the Yavruchin are is Arabic. A bunch of different commentaries use Arabic to get the meaning of the word. They say that this word Yavruach in Aramaic comes from an Arabic word. Now, I don't know Arabic at all, but I can use Google Translate. So I looked it up, and this is what I found. Mandirika. That's not Yavruach, and it just sounds like Mandrake. But it sounds too much like the word Mandrake. Seems like that's probably the modern way to say Mandrake in Arabic, and it's borrowing from the Greek root. Now, as I said, I don't know anything about the language. If there's anybody out there who does know Arabic and can help us out, please let us know what's going on in the comments. But I did some digging to try and find the word Yavruach in Arabic, meaning mandrake, and eventually I found this. Yavruach. There we go. Now we have the connection, and we know that at least according to some opinions, the Dudaim and the Parsha are mandrakes. And that's where the fun starts. We'll start with Ibn Ezra, who translates Dudaim as Yavruchin, which we established as mandrakes. He says that these Dudaim, these Yavruchin, had a very good smell, and then he goes on to explain that Yavruchin are shaped like human beings. Now this is where we start to see the weird magical mandrake stuff. And this idea of mandrakes having a human form shows up in all sorts of non-Jewish mythology and lore. When I dug around, I found an endless supply of medieval paintings and drawings of mandrake roots depicted as weird little dudes growing in the ground. Now once I made this connection to the mandrake root being shaped like a human being and maybe being some sort of plant man, the first thing that came to my mind is a creature that's mentioned in Gemara and Midrash and in various different commentaries called the Adne Hasada and it's also sometimes called the Yidua. 
This is a humanoid monster creature that is attached to the ground by its umbilical cord. It can't leave the radius of its umbilical cord thingy that's attached to the ground and it just grazes in a circle and if anybody gets close to it, they get eaten. I will definitely do a video about this in the future. Back to the future! But it doesn't seem like this has anything to do with mandrakes. I looked around and I tried to find a connection and it seems to me that they are two completely different things. So we'll get to the Adne Hasada sometime in the future. But for now we're focusing on the mandrakes and it seems to me from what I could find that while the mandrakes are described in many places in Jewish sources as having human form, they're not described as being animated in any way. They're not little dudes that grow in the ground. It's a plant that is shaped like a person. But that doesn't mean that the magic ends there. There's still a lot of cool stuff about mandrakes. At the end of Ibn Ezra's commentary where he's talking about the Dudaim as mandrakes, he mentions that they supposedly have an ability to increase fertility, which would make sense in this story because of the whole baby space race that I was talking about. But it doesn't make sense to Ibn Ezra that mandrakes would have that property because he says their nature is cold. This is a humorism thing. Again, another rabbit hole. I'm not going to get into it now. But suffice it to say that Ibn Ezra mentions the idea of them being able to help with fertility, but says that he doesn't understand why that would be the case. Now I should mention here that the word for these flowers in Hebrew, dudaim, is actually related to the word for love or beloved, just like my name, David. My new favorite Chumash, the Book of Genesis by Open Book Press, which I've mentioned before, but I'm shamelessly mentioning it again, actually translates it as love herbs, which I think is absolutely brilliant. So many commentaries talk about this plant as having the ability to increase fertility. Svorno mentions this idea, but says it a little bit differently. He says that the Yavruchin, the mandrakes, are actually an aphrodisiac, that they can actually make two people be more attracted to each other. And he adds that Reuven, who apparently, according to the math, could only have been at maximum five years old at the time, was very righteous and smart for figuring this out and trying to help. Okay, so, so far we've got the mandrakes are kind of shaped like people, and they might have the ability to help people have children, or to make people be more attracted to each other. Ramban, or Nachmanides, kind of puts this all together, and also answers some questions. He points out that Rachel, who was the one who ended up with the mandrakes, was able to become pregnant because her prayers were answered by Hashem, and not because of the medicinal properties of a plant. And he goes even further and says that if this plant has those properties, it's the root that would have those properties. Who here can tell me the properties of the mandrake root? And Reuven didn't pick the plant because of the root and its medicinal properties, he picked the plant for its flowers, which were pretty and smelled nice. And he adds that he's never seen anything in any medical books about mandrakes helping with fertility. So according to Ramban, he doesn't even think that the plant has these effects, and even if they did, that's not what's relevant to the story at all. Which would kind of end the rabbit hole here. But there's still a lot more. Once I was satisfied that I had found enough weird mandrake stuff on the commentaries on the Parsha, I expanded my search radius to see if I could find Yavruchin in other parts of Torah, which led me to a piece from Talmud Yerushalmi. There it's talking about how you're not allowed to use verses from Torah as incantations to heal wounds or cure illnesses. And then it mentions specifically that you can't say a verse over Yavrucha. So what's Yavrucha? According to Korban Ha'eda, which is a commentary on Talmud Yerushalmi, Yavrucha is the name of a specific type of illness. But then he offers an alternative explanation and says that Yavrucha means Yavruchin, that's our mandrakes. And he says that Yavruchin have this property, that anybody who uproots them, it's dangerous for them. And so the Talmud Yerushalmi is telling us that you can't use psukim, or verses from the Torah, to help make it safe for somebody to uproot mandrakes so that they won't get hurt. Now this idea that it's dangerous to uproot mandrakes is something that I saw when I did my digging around the internet, but I didn't want to talk about it until I could find it in Torah. It mentions in a bunch of non-Jewish places that somebody who uproots mandrakes dies. It's also quite dangerous. The mandrake's cry is fatal to anyone who hears it. And therefore, the method to uproot mandrakes is that you have to tie the root to an animal and let the animal do it, and then the animal dies. So I dug around to see if I could find that idea in Jewish sources, and I did. But in order to understand that, we have to back up a little bit. This whole story in the Parsha about Reuven picking flowers and then giving them to his mother Leah, and then Leah trades the flowers to Rachel so that Leah can be with Yaakov that night, that's actually the origin story of Leah's next child, Yisachar. At the end of Sefer Bereshis, the book of Genesis, when Yaakov is giving blessings to all of his children, he says, Yisachar Hamor Gorim, which is translated as Yisachar is a strong-boned donkey. But the Gemara plays with that verse and interprets it midrashically to mean Yisachar Hamar Garim, Yisachar was caused by a donkey. My fault. 
According to Rashi, Yaakov was riding on his donkey, and Hashem caused the donkey to veer towards Leah's tent, which is how Hashem intervened in this whole episode, so that Yisachar would be born, and thus Yisachar was caused by a donkey. But there's a Midrash that has a different version of how Yisachar was caused by a donkey, and it involves mandrakes. The commentary Tzror Hamor brings this Midrash from Midrash HaGolui, which interestingly is a compilation of Midrashim that only appears in the form of a few snippets that are brought in different places in this one commentary. And this is what he says in our Parsha. He says, according to this Midrash, Reuven went out to graze his father's donkey. He took the donkey for a walk, and then when he was done, he tied the donkey to the root of this plant, the Dudayim, which he didn't think anything of. And then he went on his way, but when he came back, he found that the donkey was dead, and the other end of the rope was attached to these uprooted mandrakes. Because, as we know, anybody who uproots a mandrake dies, and that's what happened to the donkey. Reuven thought these flowers were pretty and smelled nice, and so he gave them to his mother, and that's how Yasachar was caused by a donkey. And also mandrakes. Okay, so far what we found out about mandrakes is that they're shaped like human beings, even though they're not animated. They're not like little mandrake dudes, but they're shaped like people. And they might be able to increase fertility or attraction. And we found a couple of sources that anybody who uproots them dies. So that's pretty cool. And when I started looking into this idea, it became very clear that the rabbit hole was leading me to magic potions and herbology. But before I got into any of that, I felt like it was important to acknowledge that the Gemara refers to Torah as a magic potion. But I didn't want to just throw it in as an aside. Torah can't just be an aside. I wanted it to lead to our exploration of potions. So I decided to go to the person who sent us down this path to begin with. The person who told us to follow the flowers, my brother Rabbi Shastaub. So I'll hand it over to him to explain this idea to us and get us to the next part of our rabbit hole. Okay, thank you, David. I'm going to try to help out over here. I think I understand what's happening. Um, I suggested to you to check out the mandrakes and see if you'll find some weird stuff, and it seems that you did. And you are exploring the idea now of all types of magical potions, which is definitely rabbit hole worthy. And you'd like to first acknowledge the idea that Torah itself is referred to as a Sam Chaim, a medicinal healing herb, or maybe, in fact, you might call it the quintessential or archetypical herb, or even the original herb, although I think original herb is the name of a flavor of Ricola cough drop. But it is on the CRC recommended list, so it's got that going for it. Which is nice. Let's talk about Torah as an herb. Let's go to the Talmud, Yuma 72b. Amar Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi said, "My dear what is the meaning of the verse? V'zeis ha-Torah asher sam Meisha. This is the Torah that Meisha placed or put. Sam sin mem means he put or he placed. This is a Torah that Moses placed. So the Gemara tells us, Zacha, if a person merits, nasis le sam chayim. Torah is a sam. It's a little pun. Sam he put." Moshe put is sin mem. Samach mem is herb, but a sin and a samach are interchangeable because phonetically they're the same and they come from the same compartment of speech, from the hey mitzvahs hapet. At any rate, so if a person is zeicher, if he merits, then nasis le sam chayim. Taita will become an elixir of life, a life giving medicinal herb. Leizacha, but if he doesn't merit, nasis le sam misa. The same Torah will become for him a deadly herb, which I guess you would call a poison. So how is it possible that one and the same thing could be both a medicine and a poison? So Chassidus explains, and particularly in the Kuntras Eitz Chayim from the Rebbe Rashab, that the idea of being Zeicha, of meriting, is also related to the idea of Zichuch, of refinement. That a person who is refined, that means humble, selfless, spiritually conscious, then when he learns Torah, it will benefit him spiritually. It will bring him closer to Hashem. But if a person learns Torah with ego, if he learns it just to be smarter than everybody else, then it could actually, God forbid, spiritually damage him. And by the way, how does one make sure that one has the proper, selfless, humble attitude toward Torah study so that it will be a life-giving medicine? Through studying Panimia Satayra. See this, you know, the spiritual mystical teachings that are about 
abstract concepts that we can never fully properly completely understand so it kind of puts us in our place and it humbles us it makes us refined and then even when we're doing fun things like going down the partial rabbit hole it's healing us it's giving us life and with that i'll hand it back over to you for your wonderful viewers who are all spiritually refined to continue going down the Parsha rabbit hole with you reverently and respectfully. And may everything that you find in the Parsha rabbit hole be an elixir of life. Thank you, Chase. And now we can continue on to magic potions and herbology. When I started digging deeper into the magical qualities of the mandrakes, it led me to Shar HaGil Gulim by Chaim Vital, which explains the Kabbalistic teachings of his teacher, the Arizal. Right in the middle of some Kabbalistic explanations of Chumash, it veers off into a list of special plants and their properties. It says, these are a few of the plants that my teacher taught me about, and he says that I'm not going to go into detail, but here it is generally. Now, some of you might have heard Kabbalah and magic plants and thought, okay, that makes sense, but it's really uncharacteristic. Kabbalah doesn't do that. I remember a few years ago, my brother and I were trying to find some sources about alchemy in Torah, and we couldn't find anything. For centuries, alchemists have labored in vain, trying to turn lead into gold. So this is an unusual and uncharacteristic trait. Now, most of the plants mentioned here are described as having pretty normal medicinal effects. For example, there's a plant that's described as having very large leaves and a giant tube-like stalk that grows up from between the leaves that's more than two feet tall, and some sort of fuzzy stuff grows inside of it. And he says that the juice of this plant can be used to help somebody with urinary problems who is urinating too often. If anybody out there knows what this plant is, please let me know in the comments. For no particular reason, just a friend wants to know. There's a lot of plants in this list that help with eye problems, but the most interesting one is the mandrakes. And here's how he describes it. He says that the fruit of the mandrake is called tapuchim shaitim, fool's apples, or insanity apples. And he says that this plant derives its power from the laha tacher of hamisapeches, the flame of the spinning sword. So in Bereshis it says that when Adam and Chava were kicked out of Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, the entrance to Gan Eden was protected by this spinning fire sword. And it shouldn't surprise you that the spinning fire sword has some sort of Kabbalistic implications. I don't know what they are. If anybody does, please put it in the comments. But apparently mandrakes are connected to it. And he says that's why their fruit is called tapuchim shaitim. Shtus, which means foolishness or insanity, is also related to the word for bending or leaning. Which I assume is why we're connecting this to the spinning sword. And he says therefore it causes shtus, insanity or foolishness, to the person who eats them. Now I'd like to point out here that mandrakes are actually part of the nightshade family and they are poisonous, they are toxic. And part of their toxicity is that they have a hallucinogenic effect. Greek elephants on parade, here they come, hippity hoppity. And I'm assuming that's what he's referring to here. But it doesn't end there. He goes on and explains that this is how you can use it. If you take these fruits and you wrap them in deer skin and then hang them around your neck, they can be used to save you from a sword attack because the person who attacks you, their sword will get flipped on them and it'll kill the attacker. And then he adds at the end that if you take the skins of the fruit and dry them and grind them, you can make some sort of medicinal eyeshadow. So this led me to thinking about poisons, and so I searched for Samhamavis, an elixir of death. And this is what I found in Sefer Chassidim. Yehuda Chassid in Sefer Chassidim gives some advice for somebody who finds himself in a situation where they fear that they might be poisoned. He says this is what you should do. Craft a knife from snake bone, and then take that knife and stick it into stuff. Bread, or a table, anything you think might be poisoned. And he explains that since snakes are full of venom, their bones can absorb the poison that's made from snake venom. So when you stick the knife into the bread, it will absorb the poison. And he says if you stick the knife into a table and there's poison there, even if that poison wasn't actually made from snake venom, the two similar substances will still attract each other, and the snake bone will attract the poison and remove it. Trust in me. Now, the most interesting thing I found about magic plants was from Moira Nevuchim, the Guide for the Perplexed by Rambam, Maimonides. But the thing is, Rambam doesn't believe in any of it. He uses it all as an example of ancient pagan absurdity. And he mentioned a specific book called On Nabataean Agriculture. And he uses it as an example of particularly ridiculous things that he says are complete nonsense. But it's fun, so we'll go through one of them here. He says, according to this 
book of ancient pagan nonsense. There was once a tree that they used for prophecy that somebody would go to and get prophecy from this tree, an Asherah tree. And the tree was having an argument with some mandrakes. Excuse me, are you the singing bush? Because the mandrake plant wanted to take its place. And I don't think it just means it wanted to take its physical place, I think it wanted to take its place in terms of being a magical guide to the people. And so when the magician came to get advice from the tree, the tree wouldn't give it to him. And he said, hey, I'm busy with this whole fight with this mandrake. And the tree said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go ask all the magicians which is better for magic, me or the mandrake? And then Rambam doesn't finish the story, and he says if it wasn't for monotheism becoming so prominent in the world, our days would be much darker than they are now. Which is saying a lot, because Jews were dealing with a lot of persecution, as we have throughout time. But apparently it would be even worse if everybody believed in magical trees. What do you think you're doing? Now, Rambam does something that I think is amazing here. He uses something that he thinks is completely irrational to take things in Torah that seem irrational and make them rational. I'll tell you what I mean. Rambam goes through a bunch of chukim, mitzvahs that don't make sense. Like not mixing wool and linen, and not grafting plants. And he explains that the reason why we do all of those things is because each one of those mitzvahs corresponds directly to some sort of ancient pagan ritual. And that's why we can't do it. And he goes through and uses this book to mention specific rituals and show how different mitzvahs that we have correspond to those specific rituals. So the Rambam takes things that he thinks are nonsense and uses them to take things in Torah that could be perceived as nonsense and make them make complete sense, which I think is really neat. So we know that magic doesn't have a prominent place in Torah. Even if we can find examples of magical things, it's not how we do stuff. We know that we're forbidden to practice magic, whether it works or not. But there's also a lot of stuff that's kind of gray area magic that might be allowed. And even that we're not that into. And I wanted to try to find a reason for why we're not into those types of things from somebody who actually believed that such things were possible. And so the last thing I'm going to share with you is another piece from Sefer Hasidim. It asks this question. Why didn't Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon, put all of his wisdom into books instead of just the three that we have? King Solomon was the wisest person ever, and he knew everything. Why didn't he write it all down for us? And Sefer Hasidim answers that it would lead to Bittel Torah, neglecting Torah and mitzvahs. And then he gives some specific examples of the type of Chachma that we're talking about. He says there's a type of Chachma, a type of knowledge, that would allow you to be able to look at an animal, and without slaughtering it, you'd be able to tell if it has some sort of otherwise undetectable internal injury that would render it non-kosher. And also he says there's a type of chachma that would allow you to look at various pieces of meat that are all mixed together and tell which ones are kosher and which ones are non-kosher. And he says this knowledge wasn't transmitted to us because if it was, we would rely on it. Now what I think is so cool about this is that the end goal is the same. He's talking about a situation where we're using the magic to figure out if meat is kosher or not. So in the end, we're eating kosher meat, right? The problem is the process. So what I think Sefer Hasidim is telling us here is that one of the greatest things about Torah is the process, not just the punchline, is it kosher or not. It's about following the winding path through Torah to get there, which is very rabbit hole. And speaking of the rabbit hole, that's it. We got to the end of this one. As always, if you have any questions or ideas that send me down more rabbit holes, please put them in the comments. Thank you for following me down the rabbit hole. If you find any magical plants down here, don't touch them. I don't know what they do.